Hi, if you are interested in ESP32s, you are likely familiar with ESP32 modules which are used in various products, from development boards to professional devices. However, sometimes instead of using a module, you will see designs that use the discrete ESP32 MCU directly. In this video, I'll explain which option is better or more suitable for your project, so you can compare them and decide which one fits best for your next design. The first factor to consider is solderability. When using an ESP32 module instead of a discrete MCU, soldering is much easier because the module's pins are larger and more accessible. Even a regular soldering iron works well and you simply place the module, apply the solder paste or regular solder and solder each pin one by one. If you use a discrete ESP32 microcontroller instead of a module, things get a bit more complicated. While it's fairly easy to solder other components such as voltage regulators, buttons and smaller resistors using a tweezer and a soldering iron, the ESP32 chip itself is a little bit different. You can't simply solder the microcontroller with a regular soldering iron, well, most of the time. Technically, it is possible. Some people manage to solder it by sliding a soldering iron near to the MCU and heating it up from below. However, the main reason it's difficult is that the ESP32 microcontroller has a ground pad and its underside, which makes proper soldering challenging. The most challenging part is the grounding pad located beneath the microcontroller. It needs to be properly soldered to ensure both effective heat dissipation and electrical grounding, otherwise the chip simply won't work. It's quite difficult to melt the solder beneath the microcontroller and this can't easily be done with a regular soldering iron. You could try heating the PCB from underneath, but that method isn't reliable or foolproof. However, if you have a hot air gun, the process becomes much easier. You can apply a small amount of solder paste in the center and gently slide it through across the pins. Afterwards, place the microcontroller on the PCB, make sure it's positioned correctly, and that's essentially it. Even if the microcontroller isn't perfectly aligned, the combination of heat from the hot air gun and the surface tension of the solder paste will naturally pull it into the place, making soldering quite easy. The hot air gun is also useful for localized soldering, ideal for small areas, but if you need to solder the entire board, you can use a refill of plate or similar heating tool to complete the job within seconds. So regarding solderability, the ESP32 modules are the winner. And now let's move on and compare the other aspects. The next factor is design flexibility. When using an ESP32 module, you are limited to that specific module's layout and size, which can take up significant amount of space depending on the module. For example, this is a ESP32 room module and it's filling quite a bit of PCB area. If you don't have strict PCB size requirements, maybe it's not important for you, but this constraint can affect how compact your design can be. In contrast, using the discrete ESP32 chip gives you a lot more freedom over component placement. You can design a much smaller, more compact board by positioning components closer together or omitting unused ports. For example, in this circular display project, fitting an ESP32 module would take up most of the board, leaving little room for other parts. But with a discrete ESP32 chip, you can arrange components freely, for instance, placing the antenna to a more suitable place or placing other chips nearby in your design to make design far more compact. Similarly, like this Tidigo LoRa board, it's not very dense per se, but the discrete ESP32 setup allows for a better use of PCB space, so it led them to make a smaller board. So in terms of design flexibility, the discrete ESP32 clearly has the advantage. So if you want more flexibility or want to do more denser stuff, then ESP32 discrete MCU is the winner here. Another key difference is the antenna selection. When you use an ESP32 module, you are mostly locked into the antenna type built into that module. Some versions include a connector which offers limited flexibility, for example, allowing you to attach an external antenna as seen in some certain designs. 
However, choosing a module with this connector adds a little bit more extra costs. When using a discrete ESP32, you have a wide range of antenna options. One of the easiest and most practical choices is a PCB trace antenna, which you can design directly onto board. Depending on your needs, you can choose different antenna types. For example, you might use a compact Texas Instrument reference design antenna or a wider version that offers stronger signal performance. By the way, I highly recommend and this antenna type if you have the space of course. Or another option you can use a 3D antenna which has a decent performance and also saves you some 2D space. And if you need even denser layout, very small chip antennas can be used to keep your board very compact. If you are looking for an extremely low cost option, you can even create a simple antenna by soldering a small piece of wire cut to the proper land. It works effectively as an antenna. This flexibility allows you to experiment with different antenna designs, especially when the space is limited or when you want to optimize performance for a specific application. So in terms of antenna selection and customization, the discrete ESP32 is clearly the winner. Another important thing to consider is the price. When you use an ESP32 module, you end up paying more because the module includes its own PCB and shielding, which adds to the overall cost. Essentially, you are paying for both your main PCB and the module's PCB. With a discrete ESP32 microcontroller, you are using the same internal components but without the extra PCB, so the total cost per unit is lower. However, this price difference only becomes significant in large-scale productions. If you are building just a few boards, say 5 to 10 units, the cost difference between a module and the discrete chip is not that much. Additionally, manufacturers may charge extra for each different components required with a discrete setup, such as resistors, crystals and capacitor, which offset some of the savings. And that brings us to today's sponsor, JLCPCV. I have been using their services for all my projects and their pricing is hard to beat. They provide excellent quality and reliable service, especially in PCB manufacturing, where they are one of the industry leaders. Whether you are producing just a handful of boards or scaling up to thousands or even millions, they can handle it efficiently. I highly recommend checking out their services if you are planning to manufacture your own designs. And if you are worried about soldering tiny components yourself, JLCPCB's assembly service is a great option. You can simply upload your design files and they'll handle the manufacturing and assembly for you, making the process very easy just with a few clicks. Their prices are also very competitive compared to the other manufacturers, so I highly recommend giving their services a try. Let's continue with the next factor, which is especially important for makers and prototyping, is reworkability. When using a discrete ESP32 microcontroller, it's much easier to modify or replace components. For example, if you want to upgrade your memory chip, you can simply desolder it and swap it with another one. Try different brands or capacities. If you use a module, however, this kind of modifications are quite a bit difficult. At one point, I wanted to run a test. I don't quite remember the exact purpose now, but it required replacing the ESP32 chip on a PCB that used a module. To do that, I had to remove the module's metal sheet, which turned out to be quite messy and difficult. The shield has a high heat mass, so I had to apply quite a lot of heat and flux, making the jobs quite a bit annoying. If I had been working with a discrete ESP32 instead, the process would have been very simple. No shield to remove or reinstall. That said, this advantage mainly matters during prototyping or small-scale experiments. Personally, I usually avoid using shields unless the design is intended for commercial production where compliance requirements like FCC certification make shielding necessary. And that leads us to our next topic of this video. Another very important factor is regulatory compliance, like FCC regulations. If you are using an ESP32 module that's already FCC certified, you don't need to worry about ready emissions from the ESP32 itself. That certification has already been taken care of. This means you only need to focus on ensuring that your overall device doesn't generate unintentional radiations, such as noise from power supplies or voltage regulators. For example, in a board design like this, a switching regulator might cause some interference, but apart from that, you don't have to worry about ESP32's wireless emissions. 
However, if you are using a discrete ESP32 microcontroller, the responsibility for compliance shifts entirely to you. You must ensure your design meets FCC requirements. It shouldn't interfere with other frequencies and shouldn't produce unauthorized signals. All of this can make the certification process much more complex. To be clear, even when using a certified module, you still need to go through FCC testing for your complete product. But since the module's intentional radiator already complies with FCC standards, your focus can remain on verifying the rest of the circuitry rather than the wireless section. For example, in a board like this, the component most likely to cause issues during the testing is the intentional radiator, which is the wireless transmitter. But when you use a pre-certified ESP32 module, that part is already compliant, so you don't need to worry about it. This means your focus can stay on the remaining components that might generate unintentional radiations, such as power circuits or signal lines. As a result, meeting FCC requirements becomes much easier, helping you to shorten your development time and bring your product to market more quickly. Maybe I should have mentioned this one earlier. When you use an ESP32 module, you don't need to spend much time studying the data sheets or reference designs. All the complex routing, impedance matching, and layout requirements are already handled with the module itself. In contrast, if you use a discrete ESP32 microcontroller, you need to dive deeper into the documentation and reference schematics. You must pay close attention to signal routing, antenna placement, and the correct positions of the capacitor and inductors, which can take extra time and effort. So if you want to design something quickly, using a module is much more convenient. You simply add the module's footprint to your PCB, solder it in place, and you are done. Additionally, most of these modules are compatible with pick and place machines, meaning you don't have to hand solder them. Assembly services like from JLC PCB or other PCB manufacturers can easily handle the assembly for you, making productions even more straightforward. The next point is a bit more advanced. It involves mechanical considerations. ESP32 modules tend to trap heat inside their metal shielding, which makes it difficult to dissipate. This can become a problem, especially in applications that keep the ESP32 under constant load, such as maintaining a continuous internet connection or running intensive tasks. For example, some people have even managed to run a Minecraft server on ESP32. In such high power scenarios, the module may start throttling due to heat buildup, which can significantly reduce the performance or even cause the system to stop working altogether. With a discrete ESP32 microcontroller, however, you have more freedom to manage the heat. If your design draws substantial current, like in Wi-Fi heavy applications, you can dedicate unused pin or nearby copper areas to ground, effectively creating a built-in heatsink. This helps maintain stable operation. If that's still not sufficient, you can even attach an external heatsink to the ESP32 for additional cooling. Overall, the discrete ESP32 offers far greater flexibility in managing mechanical and thermal requirements, making it clear winner in this comparison. As a final consideration, it's worth mentioning part availability and obsolescence. Some ESP32 modules, especially unofficial or third-party ones, can become obsolete over time. They might be cheaper initially, but if the manufacturer discontinues the module or the company goes out of business, you could be left with a design that's no longer produced. In contrast, using a discrete ESP32 chip greatly reduces that risk. Espressive, the company behind the ESP32, is pretty well established and unlikely to discontinue its core microcontrollers anytime soon. By basing your design directly on their chips rather than third-party modules, you ensure much longer product longevity. This is important if you want your design to remain relevant for years or if you plan to keep your products available without frequent redesigns. Here is my personal recommendation. If you are designing your first PCB, I suggest starting with an ESP32 module. It's much easier, you just need to add a voltage regulator, place the module, and you are basically done. This is also a good choice if you plan to sell a small number of units, for example up to 500, because you won't need expensive testing equipment for radiation compliance. The module is already certified, so you can just assemble it and go. However, if you already designed your first PCB as a module-based board and want more flexibility, I recommend using a discrete ESP32 chip. This allows you to customize your design and optimize PCB 
PCB size and choose from a wider range of antennas. It's particularly useful for compact or dense PCBs and it's more satisfying for maker projects because you can experiment with the new things. For mass production, let's say thousands of units or more, using a discrete ESP32 also makes sense. While it requires more attention to the regulations such as FCC compliance and intentional radiation testing, the savings per unit and design flexibility can be significant. So in short, use a module for simplicity, beginners or small batches and use a discrete ESP32 for flexibility, customization, compact designs or large scale plot Action. You can also try both approaches and to see which one works best for your project. As a maker, you probably want to try both options anyway. And that's about it for now. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and see you next time.